Sports injuries are common and can occur throughout your body to bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and other structures. You can treat many minor injuries at home with rest, ice, compression, elevation, and over-the-counter pain medications. But some injuries require medical treatment. Sports medicine, prevention, and risks tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Health information based on science, built on trust. Good evening and welcome to the 21st season of On Call with the Prairie Doc. Medical information based on science, built on trust. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Dr. Kelly Evans-Hullinger, your Prairie Doc host. Tonight, we will be discussing sports medicine, prevention, and what we can do to minimize risks. Joining us in the studio this evening on the campus of South Dakota State University in Brookings are Dr. Shana Riggs from Sanford Health Brookings Clinic, Dr. Sam Schenelfenig from Avera Medical Group, McGreevy, and Dr. Clint Benj from Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Sioux Falls. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Absolutely. So happy to have you. Sam, tell us a little bit about your background. What do you do and, and what do you do in Sioux Falls? So I'm a general pediatrician for the most mm -hmm. part um, with the McGreevy Group there in Sioux Falls. Um, also fellowship trained in sports medicine. So I do a half a, half a day a week with Avera Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, mm -hmm. taking care of young kids and young adults with yeah. various athletic injuries. All right, how about you, Shana? I am a family medicine physician mm -hmm. with a fellowship in sports medicine. So I do, um, my base clinic is here in Brookings, South mm -hmm. Dakota with Sanford where I do family medicine and sports medicine, um, seeing the whole gamut of ages of people. And then I also do some outreach to um, Sioux Falls where it's just sports medicine. Yeah, great. And Clint, you're our surgeon. Yes. Tell us about yourself. So I am currently at Sanford in Sioux Falls, mm -hmm. um, fellowship trained in sports medicine. Um, I, I do some outreach, so I do outreach in Chamberlain as well as in Sheldon, Iowa. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of see um, more sports related injuries, obviously, um, from mm -hmm. the shoulder to the knee and the hip. Yeah, great. And I learned all of the people around this table were college athletes at one time in their mm -hmm. lives. So yes. passionate about sports. Um, before we start our conversation, we invite you, our audience, to submit your questions for tonight's discussion about the prevention and risks when exercising and competing in sports. Viewers can contact us three ways. Call 1-888-376-6225, send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org, or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible given the time available. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover and we apologize if we don't get to your question. To encourage you to ask early, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of the program. Your question will remain anonymous, but please provide contact information when you submit your question. Um, so let's just dive right in. I think a common sports related question that I get a lot of is about concussions, especially when we're talking about um, young athletes, college athletes. Um, I also, you know, I feel like I'm not that old, but sometimes when I actually think about it, I was like, well, that is a long time ago that I played high school sports, but things have changed around concussions in the last 20 years. Sam, when and why did we start being so much more proactive about concussion screening and that kind of thing? I would say probably it's been about 20 years. Yeah. Um, my first year covering as, a, as an intern in 2004 looked very different from a concussion standpoint compared to what I do now. In fact, in those days, I had a little card that I would carry, and based on symptoms, I would grade it as a grade one, two, or three, and make a decision right there of whether they could play later that day, or they could play tomorrow, or they could play in a week. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the science sort of caught up with the, with the medicine side of things and realized, yes, that's all not a bad idea to approach it, but there wasn't any evidence to support it in that. Mm. You can't really say how severe a concussion is based on any symptoms that happened at the time. And so that was when everything first started to change from, yes, we need to allow these athletes to rest, and yes, we should take into account their school life and how a concussion affects them in, in a school. And then how do we get them back? How do we know when they're safe to go back mm -hmm. and play? And over 20 years, it's evolved significantly yeah. since then. So 
Um, and it's much more much more mainstream now. I feel like coaches and parents are much more versed now in concussions mm -hmm. compared, compared to maybe an older generation that didn't care so much about them. Mm -hmm. Remember, hey, I played with concussions. They're not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. I feel like that mindset has really gone away, yeah. um, which is to the benefit for, right. of all athletes. Yeah. Because why are they a big deal, Shana? Because you're, you're right, there are a lot of older athletes watching this that probably remember getting a concussion every other game that they played, and right. they're fine. Why are they a big deal? Well, I mean, I, I think they started recognizing a lot of these, you know, post-concussion syndromes and um, uh, the, the NFL athletes, like things that were coming out that we tried to, not we tried to, but they were kind of not talked about, mm -hmm. and then seeing these problems down the road, that were coming to light and knowing that that probably was happening with these traumatic brain injuries mm -hmm. um, that happened to them when they were younger or mm -hmm. even, I mean, some of these guys are young and having lots of issues now. Um, so I think trying to diagnose it early on and knowing that we do not, we need to let that brain rest, we need to let it recover. Mm -hmm. um, I get a question a lot of times about, well, how many is there that yeah. before we have to stop playing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's really a number at this point. It's just what were your symptoms and how long did it take you to recover? And what do we, we want you to be an active, healthy, well-functioning adult yeah. as you get older. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to some questions because I actually see some questions related to the topic we're talking about coming through. Um, how about, let's see, T tell us about, so you mentioned these later brain injuries, yeah. chronic traumatic encephalopathy is yes, a thing that CTE. we've all read a lot about and yeah. in, in about professional athletes, especially CTE. Is it a common worry in high school athletes? I mean, is that the main thing that you're counseling young athletes about when you're telling them, you know, I mean, no, no high school athlete wants to sit out for a week, right? So how do you counsel young athletes through that? Uh, very, very much dependent on the situation. Yeah. Um, fortunately, CTE is not something that I encounter in the, the youth population. It happens decades later, but the fear of it is certainly there. Yeah. Um, and I feel like in my practice, I've seen a shift from parents who wondered if this concussion is too many or how many can I have mm -hmm. to the point where they come in with their first concussion and they're asking me, should they continue to play football? Yeah. Like, I'm worried about their life in 20 years and it's only been one concussion. And the unfortunate thing is we don't know. I mean, we, yeah. we, we know about that late effect, but there's so many variables that lead to it. And yes, we're seeing more of it now, but we have already changed the game, um, no pun intended, when it comes to concussions and that maybe we'll see less of it as time goes by because we're doing a better job of identifying it and managing it now. I'll be, we'll know, and we'll know in 20 or 30 or 40 years because yeah. um, that's how long it's going to take for us to figure that kind of stuff out. But it's a common fear um, and a common question, like she and I mentioned, like there is no number, but mm -hmm. that's what I get asked. Like, right. sure. this is his third one. Is this too many? Or this is the second one in a season? And those are all unique, unique decisions. Those are all individual discussions with families mm -hmm. about the benefit of sports because I would also don't want to pull them away from yeah. the sports. We all know that it's um, very beneficial for them, but mm -hmm. what kind of risk are we willing to accept and the unknowns that I don't have a crystal ball and can't answer right. those questions at the hardest part of our job. Sure. Yeah, it's not like a one size fits all, yeah. you know, and how you manage them and how you, you know, see people coming back. It's just individualized mm -hmm. very much like that. Yeah. Good. We're getting plenty of questions, so we're just oh, gonna good. we're just gonna dive right in. Um, we had one question. I'm gonna ha ask Clint to take this one. What are your opinions on continuing sports through an injury to the knee? And that's maybe a wide variety of things. This person actually said specifically continuing sports with an ACL tear. Um, so maybe you can speak about knee injuries in sure. general and then <clears throat> ACL tears. Yeah. So there's obviously varying levels of what knee yeah. injuries there could be, but if you're specifically talking about an ACL, what are the risks of playing through an ACL? And the biggest risk that we worry about and the reason that we tend to treat ACLs mm -hmm. operatively, especially in young athletes, is that we know that the ACL is the primary stabilizer of the knee, mm -hmm. um, both translationally and as well as rotationally. So to continue to play on an ACL deficient knee, you're putting that knee at risk of forces that are being mm -hmm. increased across the knee joint itself, putting you at increased risk for injuries to the cartilage, injuries to the other intra, um, intra articular structures such as meniscus, other mm -hmm. ligaments. So it, it's, it's, it's something that when we identify these knee injuries, we really want to figure out exactly what it is. There are certain injuries that you certainly can play through, but there's also certain injuries that we would not advise playing through mm -hmm. because they're going to put you at higher risk for worsening injuries 
or injuries that are going to set you up for having worsening issues with the knee moving forward as you're older. Yeah. And I suspect, it, does it depend also on what sport the person plays? Maybe their age and yep, maybe, exactly. you know, if it's, if it's your, your 50 year old patient going back to pickleball, maybe it's different than your teenager going back to Exactly. You know, and a lot, of it de- a lot of it depends on who we're dealing with here. Yeah. If we're dealing with, you know, someone that's just kind of recreationally wanting to get mm-hmm. back to sport, a lot of times we can do bracing, work with physical therapy, mm-hmm. strengthen some of the muscles around the joint as dynamic stabilizers of the knee to mm-hmm. kind of help offset the loss of a static stabilizer such as a ligament. But when you're talking about a younger athlete that's trying to get back into a more competitive level, those time, in those situations, it's not as easy to get them back to playing without addressing it maybe from an operative standpoint. Got it. Um, Sheena, how can a person avoid sprains and strains? So maybe, you know, more the overuse type injuries. Overuse, what, what can people yeah. do to protect themselves from, I mean, you know, some things occur mm-hmm. at random and there's nothing you can right. do about it, but what can people do? Um, warm up, cool downs, very important. Mm-hmm. Um, not jumping into something going from zero to 60 right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be a gradual increase in your, you know, intensity or your mileage or what, Mm -hmm. what it, you know, have you. Um, So those are some big things. Um, And strengthening, I mean, Mm -hmm. strengthening is huge. And I don't think it's um, thought of as much, you know, when you're preparing to start your season or whatever you're doing, strengthening those muscles, especially for, for, loading the joints and for doing everything that they help with is so important too and mm-hmm. i just think people think i'm going to go run and that's going to strengthen it's it's really not mm-hmm. strengthening um that's cardio yeah so yeah so yeah. some strength training yes. helps too okay um I've gotten some questions this week actually and it looks like we got a question too Sam so we see a lot of younger athletes specializing in a single sport kind of yeah. earlier. I mean, yeah. again, it's one of these things that's making me feel older than I normally do feel, but um, you don't see as many athletes doing three plus sports. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that's risky for young athletes as far as injuries and that kind of thing? I do. Yeah, yeah there's a pretty strong correlation of overuse injuries from single sport athletes, mm-hmm. um, especially the athlete who plays the same sport on multiple teams. Like maybe they play for their club team at school and then they're also in this the city league. Um, so they're playing constantly. They don't allow their bodies to rest. Um, part of it, I think, is a is a it's probably the drive of professional sports in terms of the financial aspect of it, um, college scholarships, that kind of stuff. So I think that's the major driver. But part of it is, is, is also a misconception of. I remember being a young athlete myself and thinking, you know, I could easily think of, well, if I had just swam my whole life instead of doing other sports would I have been a better swimmer when mm-hmm. I got to the college level? And I think a lot of parents think that way of like, boy, my, my kid is good at baseball. If he does nothing but play baseball, mm-hmm. he will be a really good baseball player by sure. the time he's older. And it's actually the opposite that's true. They're more likely to burn out. They're more likely to be injured. And so I talk to families a lot that playing different sports is actually good for their kid because it trains their muscles in different ways. Mm-hmm. It helps keep the, the fire alive. If they love mm-hmm. playing basketball, well, I'm in the off season, but I get to look forward to playing basketball again. And those skills are translational in that just because you're playing soccer doesn't hurt your basketball game. It's still cardio sure. fitness. It's still um, aspects that will help them mm-hmm. um, from one sport mm-hmm. to the next. So yeah, we really look at that um, huge risk of huge risk yeah. of burnout and overuse for the single sport athletes. Yeah. Great, love that advice. Um, how we uh, questions back to concussion. So Shana, what are the common symptoms of concussion? And caller asks, how would I know if I have a concussion? Right. What are common symptoms? Um, potentially a temporary loss of consciousness, dizziness, um, blurry vision, nausea, vomiting, headache, um, confusion, maybe being unable to recall events that had just happened. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times people had, you know, were around you at that time and maybe had witnessed the event when it did. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the very early ones. They can resolve after 15 minutes or so, but that doesn't mean it didn't still happen. Mm -hmm. And you might not feel the prolonged effects, things that come up later on if it's not seen right away or not, you know, evaluated. And another question along those lines, Sam, we had a question about our protocols for rest for concussions different for kids than adults? Does um, that evolve at all or is the advice pretty similar? It's a pre- pretty similar yeah. approach. I'd say the, the, the difference is more the individual, individual athlete in their sport mm-hmm. um, because a, a contact sport to me requires a, a greater degree of preparation to go back out and play football 
versus a swimmer who got a concussion doing something but swimming since their whole sport is aerobic non-contact in the water mm -hmm. okay we probably don't need as big of a ramp up so it's more the general approach of we're going to gradually increase our activity level we're watching for any worsening symptoms as, as that activity level is increased and got a little it. bit of the history for somebody who's sure. had multiple concussions or perhaps it took a long time for us to get to the point of making that return to play decision I'm probably not going to clear somebody in four days mm -hmm. if it took me two months to get to that point of getting ready to clear them. Like, we're probably going to need a longer period of time to get them back into their sport. Got it. Well, the sports world recognizes that concussions are linked to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, and continues to take measures to prevent more players from developing CTE. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer spoke with an athletic trainer about a new way to diagnose concussions. Caleb Burney is an athletic trainer for Monument Health in Rapid City, as well as an outreach trainer for South Dakota School of Mines. He says a concussion occurs from head collisions, and it ranges from football helmets to soccer balls. So basically what happens is, you know, you get hit in the head, and then your brain actually shifts inside your skull, and then it's actually, a lot of times it's that recoil of the brain, right? So you get hit from here. Your brain inside the skull comes out to the side and then it's going to shift back. So it's almost like the whiplash. Um, and so that's, so it's basically a bruise on the brain in a lot of ways. So that means you're getting more blood into the brain, which can obviously cause more damage. The Sway Medical app is a new type of concussion test and it's used on your phone. Bernie says the app can diagnose concussions from baselines gathered at the beginning of the year and compare them to after a collision through swaying. This baseline test kind of gives us an idea of their cognitive mental state. It also helps us understand their balance and their reaction time and other things like that, too. All the player has to do is answer memory questions, play reaction time games, and then hold the phone up to their chest. You put the phone right against your chest, and it kind of calculates how much you're moving. You close your eyes and you're balancing. Um, and you do that a couple times for your baseline. The Sway Medical app also does symptom checks daily after a concussion is diagnosed. It's nice because you can just kind of send that kid a link to their phone and then they can do the, they can do the symptom checklist on them with, by themselves. Um, that helps us a lot, especially with all the travel that we do. And sometimes kids get left, left back so they can, you know, focus on their schoolwork or whatever it may be. Um, so that lets us, you know, be able to still provide medical coverage or medical care to those patients and those athletes. Bernie says he enjoys the Sway app as it's very accurate and easy to understand. It compares it to its previous tests, so you know that it's going to be very similar. And then you can compare each test to, to different ones if you need to. He also says compared to other concussion tests, like the impact test with a computer mouse, the Sway Medical app is a better indicator for kids because they're on their phones more than a computer. And it's basically like playing a game. It's kind of fun watching the kids do their baselines or do the tests because they are, they're looking at it and they're, they're doing all these things, trying to get the, the right answer and jumping around. So it's, it's, uh, it, it seems to work pretty well with the way kids are set up these days with how much they use their cell phones. Interesting stuff. So like in all areas of medicine, new technology to help with concussion diagnostic management. Are you seeing stuff like this used wide, widely? I don't know yeah. about widely, mm -hmm. but yes, I've, yeah, we're trialing yeah. that with one of our tools to yeah. compare it to some of the other things we do with monitoring concussions. And yeah, great. Um, well, let's get back to some, some uh, quick caller questions. We have a caller from Ipswich wondering how long does a cortisone shot last? Um, why don't you start with this one, Clint? <laughs> that is a great question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the answer is kind of a cop out, but it's it's variable. Yeah. So, so that's we don't I, when I when I consult patients on steroid injections, I, I tell them it could help for several months. Mm -hmm. It could help for a couple of days. It may provide no relief. Mm -hmm. We do know that we like to space them out at three month periods. That's not just an arbitrary number. We there's plenty of literature that would suggest that getting too high of concentrations of steroid into the joint is actually toxic to the cartilage and can mm -hmm. actually have the reverse effect of something, some of the stuff that we're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, but the answer is it's, it's variable. Mm -hmm. Everyone responds a little bit differently with how long that cortisone will last and how much relief they'll get with the cortisone. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a tough question to answer, but it's a very common question I get in clinic. Sure. 
Sure. Do you use cortisone a lot in sports injuries or more with sort of arthritis and, and that kind of thing? It tends to be more, with, it, it yeah. tends to be more with more with the degenerative yeah. uh, injuries. Um, so arthritis, um, sometimes with sometimes more with inflammation like tendonitis uh, mm -hmm. injuries. Not a lot in the sports population as far as younger athletes. We try to avoid that mm -hmm. in, in that in that age range and in that population. Yeah. Because um, we know it's going to be temporary, and mm -hmm. we're not. We'd rather address what the what's actually physiologically causing the injury, whether it's overuse or if it was an actual structural injury, versus mm -hmm. trying to use an injection to solve the problem. Sure, sure. Um, let's see. We've got um, a question about how do I treat an overuse injury? So Shana, we yeah, touched we, on that. Yeah, I what mean, are the common ways? What what was it? What would an overuse injury look like? What well, it could be anything yeah. from a stress fracture of the bone mm. to the tendinopathies or the inflammation of the tendons that we see. Um, or in kids, you can actually have injuries at their growth plates from mm -hmm. overuse injuries. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the same principles apply. Um, warm up well, mm -hmm. static and dynamic. Well, I should say more dynamic mm -hmm. kind of warm-ups where you're moving, you're jogging or swinging your legs back and forth, but kind of like the get moving into it. Mm -hmm. And then the cool down is more of some of the static stretches and things like that. Um, and then again, don't jump into something quickly, mm -hmm. especially if, you ha if you're new to it. Um, you want to slowly build up and really listen to your body too. If there's an injury that you're having, that's not just a soreness that just isn't mm -hmm. the you know you just lift it and yeah my legs are are sore because it was leg day um it's more of this doesn't go away this is changing the way i'm walking this pain is here mm -hmm. um you need to get that looked at and then yeah. address what's going on or maybe it's just uh, your gear isn't isn't right for you it's not your shoes are not mm -hmm. supporting you so there's a lot of things that you, we try to address that's leading to that overuse yeah yeah, good. Um, Sam, we had a question. What nutrition do I need to make sure I can participate in exercise? What's what's important nutritionally when it comes to exercise? Um, it, de it definitely is going to depend mostly, I would say, on the individual and the sport. Because yeah. um, certainly sports that are your endurance sports are going to require a lot more carbohydrates. Um, if you're a, a football player and you need to get big, then protein is going to be a little bit part of it. But a well-balanced diet for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of questions about supplements. You know, the best supplement is mm -hmm. a supplement safe. Um, and what I always try to remind families is that supplements really should be in addition to a very healthy, mm -hmm. well-rounded diet. And if you need more protein and you can't get it through your diet, then supplement with protein. But a protein shake should not be your primary source mm -hmm. of, of nutrition. So I always encourage you know, a good, healthy, well-rounded diet and top it off with a supplement or two if we needed it. Great. Um, we had a caller from Beersford wondering about, is casting considered the best option to promote healing? So I, I will presume she's talking about a fracture. Um, they heard of leaving the affected lid uncasted to pr promote healing. Is there any truth to that or? So, and again, some of it depends on what specifically sure. the, what specific fracture we're talking about. There are certain fractures that we will immobilize with casts. Mm -hmm. There's certain fractures that once we feel like they've been immobilized appropriately, that the act of actually beginning to put weight through that bone mm -hmm. is actually will actually promote healing within the bone because mm -hmm. the more stress it sees across that fracture will actually stimulate some healing. Yeah. So again, it just depends specifically what we're talking about. Sure. Um, if it is a non-operative fracture that we're dealing with, we mm -hmm. will talk about casting. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point in time, we see enough healing where it actually to get it to continue to heal, we will actually take the cast off to help promote that. Yeah really need specific guidance from your doctor. Exactly, though, right? yes. All right, um, you mentioned stress fractures, Gina. Mm -hmm. What is a stress fracture? So it's a non-traumatic fracture of a bone, okay. and generally from overuse. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that could be for many different things. Maybe you're only, you're running every single day, four to five miles a day, not taking rest, or you went, you went from doing one mile, you know, a day to all of a sudden the next day you decide you're just going to go five miles every single day. So mm -hmm. it's a there's changes in your routine that mm -hmm. can lead to it. Um, we also see it in maybe not always females because males can get it too, but the energy that you're putting in versus what is coming out. Mm -hmm. So we, um, it's an energy deficiency syndrome that essentially um, it's not necessarily like an overuse, but it's from you know, just not not great nutrition. 
Um, so your body essentially is kind of taking its um, nutrition or what it needs from things that they don't see as being vital and mm -hmm. bone is one of those things. So mm -hmm. um, it, it just could be weakened bones after yeah. a while that can lead to it, but generally an overuse issue. Yeah, got it. Um, Sam, should I apply heat or cold to a muscle injury? <laughs> Age old question. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, you know, I would say as a general rule, like ice is, ice dulls nerve transmission, so it helps with pain that way, but it's cold, things shrink when they're cold, so if I'm treating mm -hmm. swelling, I'm probably gonna use more something more cold on that. Mm -hmm. With heat, increases your blood flow, with the blood flow is all the things your body uses to heal an injury, so ice or heat, I guess it depends on who you ask, but for things as they start to heal, I feel like heat probably generates a little bit more of a healing response. Yeah, great. Um, we got a question addressed to Dr. Bench. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most common method for ACL reconstruction nowadays and how has it changed in the last 10 years? So, that's a great question. So <laughs> historically, I'll start with that. Historically, the gold standard had always been patellar tendon mm -hmm. autograft. Um, so taking a little plug of bone from the patella as well as from the tibia where it inserts with, mm -hmm. with a strip of the tendon. Um, that had kind of been the tried and true. Um, then came along hamstring, um, <clears throat> and it's probably been it's probably been around the second longest compared to the patellar tendon, um, and kind of the new player on the block now is the quad tendon. So, so the quadriceps tendon. So, the difference being instead of taking a strip of instead of taking a bone, two bone plugs with the patellar tendon, some people all just do all soft tissue. Where they'll take just a little strip of the quad, or they'll mm -hmm. actually take a bone plug still with the quad. Um, studies are showing that. As far as re-tear rates, uh, revision rates, they're still the lowest with patellar tendon. Mm. Um, but there are side effects of the patellar tendon. Each one has their kind of pros and, and minuses, so I kind of discuss that with patients. With the patellar tendon, you're going to see a little more knee pain, harder mm. to kneel because you're taking, that makes sense, you're kind of taking a, a piece of bone from the kneecap. Um, hamstring, you don't have that as much, but you also can get some hamstring weakness because that's where you're taking the uh, tendon from. Mm -hmm. um, and then quad is, again, the new, newest kind of player on the block. Um, don't see quite as much anterior knee pain as far as being able to kneel or having mm -hmm. issues with that, but still seeing a little bit of some quad inhibition after surgery with rehab. Um, so they're all very good options, but I think you have to, again, take that and apply that to each individual patient to see exactly what they're doing. On a volleyball player, I wouldn't want to take a patellar tendon from them because they're going to be digging and mm -hmm. on their knee a lot. Um, we know that certain athletes do a little bit better with certain grafts than, other, than others do, so I think a lot of it it, it, it depends on who you're dealing with, mm -hmm. and you really just have to have that discussion with your surgeon exactly what it is you're trying to get back into doing, and you guys can make a joint decision on what the best draft option is for you. Got it. So three different ACL repairs, you might do three different actual procedures for that. Yeah. And interesting. Um, this is a great question. Sam, is cupping a reputable therapy for sports <laughs> injuries? It's awfully popular. Uh huh. You yeah, see thank it. you. Thank yeah. you, Michael Phelps, for <laughs> the Olympics. Um, I guess it's not irreparable. Irreputable. Um, yeah. I honestly don't know, compared to some of the other modalities, if it's actually superior. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed with athletes is that mental is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if they think that it's helping, mm -hmm. it's helping. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, c compared to some of the other things, soft tissue massage, scraping, various things that athletic trainers and physical therapists would do, I don't know that it's superior to anything, but from one athlete to the next, they're gonna swear by this, and the mm -hmm. next one's gonna say it didn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. So okay. first, do no harm, leave some nice little, nice little marks that, mm -hmm. that are there, but other than that, I don't think it causes any harm, okay. so. Okay. Fine to give it a try. All right. We got a question from Aberdeen. Are there um, alternatives for knee replacement surgery? Um, so Clint, maybe not a sports injury question, but why do people get knee replacement surgery and um, are there alternatives for those patients? Yeah, so usually when I have that discussion with the patient, a lot of it's dictated. There's no one x-ray where I look at and say you have to have your knee replaced. Yeah. I would say based off your x-ray, you've got degenerative arthritis and it's relatively advanced, and you'd be a candidate. Mm -hmm. A lot of that depends on how much it's impacting their life. Yeah. If they're still able to do the things and they can kind of get by day to day, you'd be surprised that some of the x-rays you could see where you're shocked that they can deal with that much arthritis, mm -hmm. but they're able to get by. So in that case, we try some of the non-operative modalities, oral anti-inflammatory medications, modifying some of the activity that you're doing, lower impact exercising mm -hmm. versus higher impact, what does that mean? 
trying treadmill exercises where it's a little lower impact. Stationary bike, um, doing a ro water aerobics mm -hmm. is a great exercise versus high impact where you're jogging on the sidewalk or yeah. you're doing a lot of repetitive things. Mm -hmm. um, oral anti-inflammatories like I talked about are a great mm -hmm. option um, that can provide symptomatic relief but can also slow the progression of arthritis moving forward. Mm -hmm. We talked about injections. Mm -hmm. There's kind of two flavors of, uh, of injections. There's the steroid, the corticosteroid injections versus visco supplementation mm -hmm. um, as an option. Um, and then I usually like, usually my conversation when I'm first seeing a patient is we like to exhaust all of those options yeah. first. And if we're able to get them by, we know the arthritis is still there. Our goal mm -hmm. is to keep them functioning and doing what they want to do. If it gets to a point where that's not making it to where they can be functional, that's when we start, we have a discussion about surgery. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. To add to that, mm -hmm. um, I do some non-operative mm -hmm. management things too. The regenerative medicine is really yes. um, becoming a big thing here too. And a lot of studies are going into that. So PRP injections and um, stem cell injections Absolutely. are all being researched right now um, for some of those patients mm -hmm. who might be a good candidate for that when it's not so far advanced. I mean, when it's advanced, there's not a lot of great options, yeah. but kind of the in-between those, it's okay, th this might help, we don't know everything. I mean, this is like a whole other show topic, really, because mm -hmm. there's a lot going into it, but mm -hmm. that's another another interesting thing that's yeah, kind of up and coming. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Verdict's maybe still out on some mm -hmm. of that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What's PRP? Help us uh, out. That's platelet-rich plasma, where we draw off your okay. blood, spin it down, mm -hmm. re-inject those platelets back in. So it's very similar. You're essentially inducing an inflammatory reaction and then bringing in some inflammatory cells to help clean up, too. Yeah. Yeah, and so now to clarify for our, our viewers, is this mainstream? Can someone call and go just say, I'd like to get PRP, or is this really investigative still? Well, it, there's a lot of investigations uh -huh. in on it, especially right. where you're putting it. So that can be placed not just into a joint, but mm -hmm. also into tendons. So there's a lot of research, let's say PRP on the knee joint, which mm -hmm. there are insurance companies out there which do cover that now. Not a lot of them, but there mm -hmm. are some because there is enough research to, to back it. Um, but yes, it's still in process, mm -hmm. all of these things. So um, it's really interesting. And it, again, it's like it could mm -hmm. be a whole other show, really, because of what's all entailed with it. Yeah. And I, more I, I, would, I, mm -hmm. I would piggyback that with you're correct. It's kind of like Pandora's box mm -hmm. right now. I think mm -hmm. a lot of the studies we're looking at in sports medicine in particular is stem cells and, mm -hmm. and alternative therapies biologics is what we kind of call them, mm, yeah. um, for not just degenerative, but right. for rotator cuff tears, mm -hmm. for when you're trying to get things, structures to heal, yeah. how can we help the body aid in that healing process? Mm -hmm, right. and I think that's kind of where a lot of the literature is, and a lot of the studies are heading of mm -hmm. what we're trying to look into as alternatives. Yeah, but All there right. are places, yeah, you can call and ask and you can find out where you yep. can get it at. Mm -hmm. I know Sioux Falls yep. mm -hmm. for sure is one. Yeah, we have one at Avera that mm -hmm. is doing some of that too. Yeah. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. While athletic trainers have an in-depth understanding of how athletes use their bodies during practice and play, and as such, they provide patients with expert advice and instructions on preventing injuries and avoiding re-injuring a previously damaged area. South Dakota State University's Director of Sports Medicine, Ben Hines, walks us through the health and welfare of student athletes at SDSU. So how's your knee been doing? Good. I'm Ben Hines. I'm the Director of Sports Medicine at South Dakota State University. A typical day is come in in the morning. Any student athletes that have set up rehab or maybe they wake up and something's bothering them from the practice the day before or the game, um, they'll contact us, shoot, them, shoot me a text, a phone call, say, hey, can I come in? Um, so the morning is kind of carved out for that, especially when I'm in season. It's not like pain, it's like pressure when I... Gotcha. And then the afternoon is, again, another usually rehab or treatment session before practice. The health and welfare of our student athletes at South Dakota State is, that's number one. So we wanna make sure that we're taking care of the student athletes, not just their um, athletic injuries or their musculoskeletal injuries, but also um, mental health and anything else that they may need, may need help with. We work very closely with our strength and conditioning staff at SDSU. And so we're able to work hand in hand with them looking at um, are there any weaknesses that maybe a student athlete has that we can work on strengthening with our strength staff in the weight room. Injury prevention wise, we're really blessed here at SCSU that our strength staff is A, as good as they are. They're very good, but B, that we have such a very good relationship with them. 
but also our staff, my, my sports medicine staff, they do a really good job of doing a lot of maybe maintenance or preventative type of, of treatment. So let's say basketball, um, maybe see quite a few ankle sprains, and so they do preventative ankle exercises. Our, our volleyball um, student athletes, maybe they have some overuse injuries with their shoulders, so they're doing shoulder maintenance programs. Same thing with baseball. Um, maybe some of our pitchers are doing some maintenance, some regular maintenance type of, of rehab or prehab. We're able to work with our strength staff and we're able to incorporate that injury prevention piece, for example, ACL preventative, um, with our strength staff. And so when they're doing their workouts in the off season, which is usually three, four times a week, our strength staff will incorporate a lot of those principles of ACL preventative maintenance into those workouts. If we're able to keep our student athletes healthy, then that means they're, they're competing on the court, on the practice field, or on the game field. And that means they're able to do what they came to SDSU to do. And so that's obviously very important. And when we're able to keep our student athletes on the field, then that means we're hopefully winning games and, um, and then everybody's happy. Great, thanks for that, Ben. Um, what are some of the most common injuries we do see in, let's say, high school, college level athletes? Sam, what, do you, what are some of the more common? Um, it will vary by sports yeah. again. Um, and certainly your contact sports, it's gonna be your dislocations and torn ligaments and muscles and broken bones, concussions. Yeah. Um, the track athletes, uh, more of your overuse injuries, mm -hmm. that's where you see more of the stress fractures, those mm -hmm. kind of problems. Yeah. Great. What are you seeing most as a surgeon from the the athletes? Kind of echo what yeah. You know, from a surgeon side, we obviously don't see the concussions that come through. Right. But that, I would say that's high, especially mm -hmm. in contact athletes. But again, in contact athletes, you're seeing a lot of the ligament injuries, mm -hmm. uh, more soft tissue injuries, fractures, mm -hmm. versus your runners. You're seeing more of the stress injuries, um, overuse injuries um, with some overhead athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, Sam, we got a question. Should my child who is a student athlete have a physical every year to assess injuries? Um, yes, I would definitely would recommend a sports physical yeah. every year. Um, even if they're an active kid, which as a pediatrician, we hope all kids are active kids. Mm -hmm. We encourage that annual well wellness exam mm -hmm. just to encourage physical activity. Hopefully they don't have any injuries, um, right. but that athletic physical is just a good time to check in on any injuries that might be lingering. Talk about ways that, again, we could address that preventative kind of things. Um, so yeah, hopefully for they don't have an ongoing injury that needs a yearly recheck, yeah. but I would say an annual physical for an athlete is important. Yeah, what are the other major things that, you know, schools make kids do a sports physical or some, what, what are the major screening things that we are looking for in young athletes? Heart is huge. Yeah. I mean, that's probably one of the biggest ones, but we all, we're also trying to screen for some of those mental health issues mm -hmm. that are happening mm -hmm. and some of the, um, you know, even for females, we're trying to make sure, are they, you know, nutrition, is it okay? Are they underweight? Um, mm -hmm. Is anything else going on we need to be aware of with that? But I think heart is probably the biggest one. That's why we have those questions on there. So it is really important that as a parent, you are helping your kids with that yeah. because they may have no idea that the family history has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right. in it and they're just like, no, I feel fine. Yeah but those are, we do screen for a reason, yeah. so. And there's just no substitute for someone laying a stethoscope on right. its chest once a year, right? Yeah. So, good. Um, we had a caller from Blackhawk wondering what the doctors think about collagen, collagen peptide supplements for arthritis. Is that something you know anything about, Clint? Yeah, and, and it, it, I feel like again, I see a lot about collagen out there. I don't know what's real and what's kind of salesmanship. Again, this is similar to Sam's comment with what type of supplement yeah. should we be taking. It, it, it's one of those things where I tell people a lot of that stuff there isn't necessarily suggested literature that supports or refutes using that stuff. So I can't mm -hmm. really say you shouldn't do it. Sure. Um, some of I, I, I go back to in my training. I always had a, uh, one of the physicians who worked with has a red M and M theory where. Red m m doesn't cost a lot of money. If it makes you feel good, you can take it. <laughs> so I tell people, be, what I'd be cautious of is you see these supplements that come out or, or things that people would recommend, oh, for arthritis, this is great, but that is a very expensive yeah. medication to get over the counter. If it's not costing you a lot of money and you feel like it helps, a lot of that stuff is safe to take. Sure. Um, I was still would have that discussion with your doctor to mm -hmm. ensure that you're not taking something that they would recommend against. 
Um, but again, it's not something that I would say I could recommend for, but again, I can't recommend against yeah. it. We just don't have, don't have the great science right. on it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Sam, we had a caller from Frederick wondering if an athlete taking Accutane for acne could affect their performance. Might there be any organ results of Accutane that could be relevant for an athlete I, or pretty I, safe? I think pretty safe. Yeah. I mean, I know as, as you're on Accutane monitoring like liver function, mm -hmm. I think is the, one of the more important things. And as long as that was normal, um, I've had several athletes, I'm just trying to think in my mind, several athletes over mm -hmm. the years who have been on it and I don't think I was ever worried or counseling yeah. them one way or the other. So I think it's safe. Yeah. Um, definitely a good question for the dermatologist as well, but mm -hmm. I think as long as the liver enzymes and everything are fine, should yeah. be fine. Great. Um, Shana, what sports have the highest risk of concussion? Mm -hmm. Football, mm -hmm. women's soccer, mm -hmm. and hockey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just no way around that. That's nope. part of those sports, <laughs> <That's>, right? <laughs> it's studied. It's That's where it's at. Those yeah. are the top three. And generally speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have young, young people playing the um, football or hockey yet, but trying to avoid contact at younger ages generally in youth sports, mm -hmm. play like flag yeah. football or no checking in hockey. Right. I don't know what ages those rules typically go to. Well, I think those things have been changing so much yeah. because there's a lot of studies that have been mm -hmm. going on, especially in youth sports. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to reduce that happening, reducing the contact practices and everything. Because I think that you were seeing a lot of concussions just from practice itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So avoiding those contact um, practices has been huge. Mm -hmm. Just doing some changes just like reducing that. the yep. number of times that you might have that risk. Yep. Huh? Yeah. I think you're seeing a lot of, especially at the professional level, but that comes all the way down to youth athletics. Mm -hmm. As specifically for football, you're seeing a lot of changes in the way that helmets are developed. There's a lot of research in helmets to mm -hmm. help prevent mm -hmm. that kind of coup counter coup effect of the brain when it's when you do have a concussion um, and you're seeing it at the professional level at training camps they're wearing more padded helmets on top mm -hmm. on top of the helmet so there's That's a right. lot of stuff that they're looking into for research on how to make the protective equipment actually do a better job than what yeah. they have historically sure yeah um, what um, what are the best stretches or exercises for helping a knee injury to heal Sam do you have a handout? Do you give a handout for knee strains and sprains? Do you send people to physical therapy? Do the trainers? What do the trainers? Yeah, do? luckily in our office we have athletic <coughs> trainers, so we mm -hmm. have we have a, we have we have some more generic handouts for those type of things. But mm -hmm. but it's a, but again, stretching like we've talked about is a good you know the, very helpful and, and especially before we're doing activities, kind of getting things ready for motion and stretching is always helpful. There's also specific exercises that we could do that can kind of help keep muscles that we don't typically activate on a daily basis mm -hmm. toned. That way they can help provide some, what we call dynamic stability to mm -hmm. the joints um, and to help prevent uh, injuries. But yes, we do, in our clinic, we have we have trainers that we can see. If, it, if it's something that's a little more complex or they need a little bit more hands-on, one-on-one experience, we will have them go to see a physical therapist to work with. Sure. Yeah, we've talked about strength training a few times. Sam, is there an age that's too young to start strength training in young athletes? Or what do you advise people about things like weightlifting and kids yeah. and that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, good question. So the short answer is no. I mean, they can strength train at any age, but it's a question of what does that actually look like? Mm -hmm. um, so for younger kids with still open growth plates, they're gonna be at risk for certain injuries with powerlifting, for example. Mm -hmm. So that would, to me, like powerlifting, you're trying to build your muscle mass, you're trying to build power. That's an adolescent thing. Mm -hmm. um, when your growth plates are more mature, as a young kid, you're just trying to develop strength and endurance. And those are your body weight exercises, push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. they can develop strength that way. That translates to less injuries. That translates to in increased, um, better performance yeah. on the field. It's all about supervision. It's all about technique, yeah. um, especially as yeah. kids get into weightlifting making sure they're supervised. The tendency is always to outlift each other, but are you doing it correctly? Are you putting yourself at risk for more of an injury? Yeah, great. Um, I read a great article this fall about the reduction in a lot of states in, you know, sadly, we often hear in those summer months when football is getting started and, you know, a lot of places in the country, it's really hot about a young athlete dying yeah. from heat stroke. Um, but my understanding is that a lot of states have kind of passed rules around mm -hmm. what can be done in the summertime as far as practices and stuff. Can you comment a little bit on that, Shayna? What's I, changed? I don't know if there's exact laws here. Mm -hmm. I can't see, but I just know we're watching, you know, you watch the 
the temperature outside and mm -hmm. the bulb, wet bulb temperature, I think, mm -hmm. is the most accurate way. But of course, I mean, who has that all the time? Right. Um, <laughs> it's a strange looking device. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it's just being aware of the, the heat and the humidity yeah. all coming together and knowing, like, up here in the Midwest, we are not used to that. Yeah. Um, down the South, where I did some training, mm -hmm. that was definitely a big deal, but mm -hmm. they're more acclimated to that too. So it's it's kind of a big issue up here when we go from training and being used to cold and mm -hmm. mild to all of a sudden being in somewhere like the heat, like we were in Missouri State yeah. <laughs> last week. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's definitely harder on those athletes yeah. to I adjust think to that. Just another cultural shift about you know, and it's not weak to take breaks and get water and stuff yes. like that. It's just we, yeah, we're, we've become wiser. And right? we've been trying. To, I know they've been trying to do like early morning and then early evening, trying to split up so you're not in the middle of the day when it's the hottest yeah. too. Yeah, good. We just have about a minute left. So we got a question about um, someone who has asthma. Sam, are there sports or exercises this person should avoid if they have asthma? It depends um, on the severity. Nope, probably, yeah. yeah, probably does depend on the severity a little bit, but an athlete with well-controlled asthma should uh -huh. be able to participate in yeah. any, any sport. Yeah, so. just make sure you got a good relationship with your doctor, exactly. got your inhalers, right? Yep, plan ahead. All right. Um, Clint, we had a caller with an unresolved golfer's elbow um, having a nerve conduction study done. Um, so maybe maybe it is golfer's elbow. What's golfer's elbow briefly, and and how do we treat it? So golfer's elbow is a it's a tendonitis yeah. of the muscle mass uh, that helps with the finger flexors. Mm -hmm. um, called golfer's elbow because we tend to we get we give these silly names. We don't actually see yeah. a lot in golfers, but that's just what they call <laughs> I'm it. About it. Um, <laughs> things you can try um, working with therapy mm -hmm. on some eccentric strengthening. What that is is you're contracting the muscles while they're lengthening yeah. the, the, the muscle. Um, that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, there's kind of offloading straps that you can sure. put um, that you can get over the counter usually. Um, mm -hmm. That those can be helpful. Um, some of it's just modifying some of the stuff that yeah. you're doing. So rest goes a long way, and that's Good. Like, usually that's the hardest conversation I have with patients is stop what to, you're doing. And it's usually my it's usually my patients that are wanting to get back to pickleball. Yeah. It's usually, <laughs> we should start calling it pickleball elbow is what we should start. All calling. right, <laughs> the winner of our prize tonight is Tracia from Beersford. Thank you for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. We'll get you a gift. And we'll be back after this. Miss an episode or looking for a specific topic? Head to our YouTube channel or website, prairiedoc.org, today to access all on call with the Prairie Doc episodes. And make sure to join us most Thursdays on SDPB and Facebook for new shows. I love sports. I have enjoyed playing and watching sports for as long as I can remember. And as someone who participated in a sport year round in high school and continued in athletics in college, I'm constantly grateful for the large impact being able to play competitive sports has had in my life. Now I am a parent, a proud coach of a young girls soccer team and a more casual observer of youth athletics. I see youth sports through the lens of how they can impact our kids Statistically, most children who try a sport or activity while young will not compete in that activity in high school. Still fewer will go on to college athletics, and of course hardly any will play a sport professionally. But I still think, if done with the right goals in mind, prioritizing fun and learning, sports can do amazing things for children as they develop. All sports can teach resilience and humility, learning a new skill, walking on a balance beam or hitting a fastball is difficult but can be done with effort and persistence. Children can learn to manage their emotions and actions when things are not easy because running a mile or making a putt takes persistence. They can learn to accept coaching and constructive criticism, skills we can all use as adults. They can quite literally fall down on the field or court and learn to get back up and try again. Another influential facet of sports is social. Being on a team teaches kids valuable social skills. Each child in a team sport will take a turn on the bench or sideline and learn to cheer on their teammates. They can encourage their teammate having a difficult time at practice. They can learn to offer a hand to an opponent who is falling down. And they can learn how to respectfully shake their rival's hand after losing, winning, or playing for fun. Finally, sports can help shape our children's views of themselves and their bodies. 
Youth sports makes exercise and activity fun, potentially affecting their view of exercise as an adult. Playing a sport helps young people focus on what their body can do and how it can feel, rather than how it looks or how someone judges it. Numerous studies have associated participation in sports with self-confidence. I think about that a lot with my own daughters. I did not become a Sue Bird or a Serena Williams, and my kids probably won't either. But I hope all the kids in my life can experience fun and learn some lessons by being included in sports. It sure made a difference for me. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Schemmelfenig, Dr. Riggs, and Dr. Benj for volunteering their time to help us learn more about sports medicine. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and online, and be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, thank you for joining us for another episode of health information based on science and built on trust. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. season and you can never have enough tissues. Excess nasal drainage can be caused by anything that irritates or inflames the nasal tissues. Runny nose relief, symptoms, causes, and treatment. Next time on call with the Prairie Doc. The vitality of a rural community is closely tied to the health of its population. Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Dean. I grew up on a farm west of Wessington Springs, South Dakota. After completing medical training nearly 50 years ago, my wife Kathy and I came back to Wessington Springs to provide health care and to raise our family. All my life, I've been an advocate for rural communities. Rural residents often encounter barriers that limit their ability to obtain the care they need. In order for rural residents to have the best health care outcomes, appropriate health care services must be available in a timely manner. The foundation of good health care is good health information. Prairie Doc programming provides rural communities with truthful health care information based on solid science. All Prairie Doc media is free and accessible through social media and South Dakota Public Broadcasting. I am honored to be a volunteer board member of the Prairie Doc organization. I know the value of providing objective, evidence-based health care education free of charge to anyone, especially to people who have limited access to healthcare professionals. Please help us to continue the legacy of Dr. Rick Holm of providing information based on science and built on trust. I urge you to go to prairiedoc.org and make a donation today, as Kathy and I have done. If you don't feel comfortable donating online, please send our staff an email and they will send you a pledge card through the mail. Thank you for believing in and supporting our mission. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. At Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello, possibility. Hello, healthy. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. 
Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications.